All right, so for chapter three, what we're going to be looking at is uh, evolution and then sort of how that process uh, plays out and how that ultimately led to the, the biodiversity um, that we have on the, the planet today. Um, so just starting out, just thinking about, again, what biodiversity is. It's just meaning the, the different organisms we have on this planet. Not everything is the, the same. Uh, and you can see these with uh, just a couple of the, the images here. So they didn't come out. Right, they're a little blurrier than I thought they'd be, um, but on the, the right hand side, we just have a, a polar bear hugging a cactus. And then on the, the left hand side, just another image kind of just illustrating the, the same sort of thing. We've got very different organisms. Um, so a polar bear at the bottom there, even though uh, there are no polar bears in the, the Antarctic. Um, dolphins or whales in the, the ocean there, and then we've got some sort of tree just coming out of, it looks like it's coming out of northern Canada. Um, and even though these things are extremely different, they're going to have different um, traits. Some of them are plants, some of them are animals. So they're just obviously different in that respect as well. Um, but they're all going to have something in common in that they all can be traced back to the, the, same, uh, the same starting point, the same single cell organism. Um, so what we're going to be looking at, like I said, is just evolution. Uh, and for, for that, what we're going to start with is just uh, adaptation. Um, so A is a good place to start. And adaptation, uh, just thinking about what that word kind of sounds like, does kind of describe what it actually is referring to. Um, so if you adapt to something, you're just sort of changing to be better suited for whatever that is. Um, so in this case, adaptation is just referring to a, uh, a population um, adapting to be better suited for the, the environment that it lives in. So it's gonna acquire some set of traits and those set of traits are going to be um, advantageous in terms of um, its survival in that environment. And then um, just to point out, uh, acclimation is going to be a very similar process, whereas adaptation is looking at an entire population, so looking at a group of organisms. Acclimation is just going to be looking at an individual organism and the, the change we see in response to its environment. So it's a similar process. It's just sort of the, the scale. Uh, is different, and then the, the length of time that, the, that this process uh, takes place on is going to be different. So adaptation, we're looking at a, a, a population, so we're looking at a larger group. It's going to be a slower process. And then acclimation, we're just looking at an individual, and it's just going to happen relatively quickly. So with acclimation, um, one way you can think of that is, uh, or at least the way I think of it, um, I'm a, a runner, so uh, I'm not a not a very good runner, um, but professional runners, especially mid distance and distance runners, what they'll often do when they're, they're training, um, they'll go to high latitude or high altitude um, locations. Uh, so there is a couple places near me in Utah where uh, professional runners would go to for, for weeks at a time to train. And the, the reason they would do that is because at that higher elevation, there's less, less oxygen. So the, 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 their bodies naturally had to acclimate to that environment. And to do that, that means their body would then produce more red blood cells so that their, their body could more efficiently transport oxygen uh, throughout it and get it to its uh, the muscles. Um, but that's gonna be an example of acclimation just because it's looking at an individual, it's gonna be a shorter process and that's not actually gonna be something that can be passed on. So if, you, if that, uh, that runner then has a, a child, they're not going to be passing on that acclimation, whereas adaptation is going to be um, these, these traits that will get passed on um, from parent to offspring. And that's why it's going to be a slower process. It's going to have to take uh, multiple generations. Um, so just thinking about adaptations, like I said, we all organisms started from the, the same point, but we got tremendously different sorts of uh, animals and plants and uh, even microorganisms, bacteria, things like that. Um, so if we just look at a, a polar bear, we can think of the, the adaptations for that polar bear, things that are gonna help it better survive in its environment, better survive in the, um, the, the North Pole area. Um, so behaviorally, we can think of adaptations in terms of how that, that organism, that population is gonna act. Um, so polar bears, for example, are going to dig dens so that they're not just exposed to the, the winds constantly. They're not going to be constantly exposed just to the, the weather. Um, and then also they're extremely strong swimmers. And that's important because especially 
uh, at this point where there's so much uh, ice melting in the, the poles that's going to allow them to, to swim and to hunt and get their, their food that way. Uh, and then physically in terms of uh, sort of their, their body composition, obviously the, the white fur is going to help them blend into the snow. It's going to make them um, better predators because they're not going to be as easily visible to whatever those other um, whatever, whatever uh, animal it's hunting is, at least if it's on the snow, if it's in the, the water, it's a little bit of a, not as good of a camouflage, but uh, in addition to that, it's got the very um, thick fat layer that's gonna help keep it warm. And then their ears as well, based on the, the size and shape of them, that helps, uh, helps them not lose as much um, body heat if it was kind of proportional to the, the rest of their, their body size. Um, and their, their shape also prevents water from actually getting in there, uh, and that helps them uh, maintain their heat a little bit as well. Uh, and then thinking about the cactus, and again, all of these started from the, the same single cell organism, but then just over time, this adaptation, and we'll see how that's going to lead, that plays into natural selection and evolution. Um, but if we think about cactuses, the, the adaptations for the cactus, now these adaptations are going to be in relation to the environment it's living in, which isn't the, the North Pole. Now it's, we're thinking about some sort of desert environment, extremely hot, extremely dry. So the, the cactus is going to adapt to better survive in that environment. Um, the, the large stems help them store water. They're, uh, if you've ever touched a, a cactus, it's kind of very thick on the outside, the, the green part, um, and it's kind of waxy. The, the reason for that is so that you don't lose water through the um, sort of the, the outer portion of that cactus. And then um, similarly, the, the cactus, it doesn't want to lose the water it has. It wants to also be able to obtain more of it. So that's why the, the root system is going to be a little different than you might see with a, um, a tree, something that really wants to establish itself in the ground and make sure it's sturdy. The cactus wants to make sure it can get as much water as possible. So it's not going to have as deep of a, a root system. It's going to be more spread out on the, the surface almost, just so it can collect as much water uh, as possible. And then all three of those things are kind of to collect and to store the, the water. We've also got the, the spine, so the, the spiky parts on the, the cactus. Um, and the reason for that is so that it can protect itself. Because if you think about it, if the, the cactus was just the same minus those spikes, it would still be great at obtaining water and sort of retaining it after it's already got it. Um, but it's gonna be extremely vulnerable, vulnerable if any other uh, animal comes by. Those animals are eventually gonna realize that there's water in there. They're eventually just gonna uh, rip apart the, the cactus and get at that water. So that's why they've uh, adapted to have those spines so that they can protect themselves. And it also helps um, in terms of not losing um, as much water as it would be if it was actually like leaves instead of those spines. Um, yeah. okay. And then with adaptation, that helps you better survive in the, the environment that you're in. Um, and then this just kind of leads into to natural selection. Whereas in um, the population that's best suited for that environment is just going to be the, the population that's ultimately going to survive. So Charles Darwin is the, the one that's generally credited with coming up with the, the idea of natural selection. He wrote the, the book you can see here um, in the, the mid 1800s when he went to see the, the Galapagos Islands. Um, and then with survival of the fittest, this is looking at, uh, again, individuals. So this is just looking at sort of a, a smaller scale, survival of the fittest. Fittest doesn't necessarily mean the, the biggest or the strongest. In this sense, fittest just means the um, most adapted for that, the best adapted for that environment. Um, so if we think about survival of the fittest, we've got multiple individuals competing for, for resources and just whichever one is best adapted is going to be the one that's going to be able to get to those resources, going to be able to be the, the one that survives. And then when this process occurs on a, a larger scale and over time, this is when we start to see natural selection. Because as we have the, the survival of the fittest play out, those animals, those individuals that are best adapted are going to be the ones that survive. And then they're going to be the ones that are most likely to 
uh, have offspring to pass on those traits. So what we're going to see over time is that the, uh, the population is going to sort of be skewed to favor those traits. And that's what we're, we're referring to natural selection, just because the, the nature of it is just basically selecting for those advantageous traits. Um, and then Charles Darwin, um, he observed this in uh, finch populations in the, the Galapagos Islands, so off the, the coast of, well off the coast of um, South America. There is a, a series of uh, islands, it's an archipelago known as the, the Galapagos Islands. And what he noticed was, um, actually I'm getting a little ahead of myself, so we'll see it there. Um, but we wanna think about what causes these adaptations. Because again, everything started from the, the same single cell organism. And then from there, we kind of branched out and got polar bears, cactus, humans, every other potential organism you can think of. So we want to think of um, what led to those adaptations. Because without those, everything would be the same. Nothing would have any advantage over uh, anything else. Um, and the, the reason for that is just gonna be sort of genetic. So the, the traits that we're referring to are just on genes, which are part of the, the DNA. And the, the DNA is just gonna be replicated, which can sometimes, uh, so we're gonna simplify it a little bit because this part I'm not too concerned with like exactly how this plays out, um, as long as you have a, a rough understanding of it. But muta mutations just occur when DNA is replicated. And then this leads to errors. And I'm putting errors in quotations there because uh, most of the time, in, at least in terms of um, natural selection and survival of the fittest, most of the time, these mutations are gonna have essentially no effect. Um, so they're not really gonna happen, or they're not really gonna, they're not really gonna cause anything too, too drastic to occur. We probably won't even notice them. Um, but every once in a while, there's gonna be a, a mutation that's gonna cause some sort of change in that, uh, that organism. And then that's gonna make it more or less able to survive in that environment. If it makes it better suited for the environment, if it's a, an, an ad adaptation that makes it um, sort of more, more able to survive, what we're gonna see is that trait's then likely gonna sort of um, propagate and we're gonna see it pop up more and more in that population. If it's something that's going to really hurt its chance at survival. What we're gonna see is that organism probably won't survive and we probably won't see that trait um, repeat within the, the rest of the population, at least not to a large scale. Or if it is there, we'll probably start to see it dwindle off. Um, so with these adaptations, again, they're just gonna be caused by uh, DNA mutations essentially. And then the, the adaptations are just gonna be uh, positive outcomes from those mutations essentially. Um, so like I talked about Darwin, he observed this in the, uh, the finch population of the Galapagos Islands. Um, and you can kind of see it here. What he noticed was the, the beaks, and then there was some uh, behavioral differences and then size of them as well. But you can really, uh, really get an idea of this in terms of the, the beak shape and size. Um, the, the reason these... Uh, these finches, they're all finches, but the, the reason that they have different beak shapes and sizes is just because um, on those different islands, on the, the Galapagos, there was different food sources, different, um, different competition, just a whole different environment there. And then that naturally just led to different beak uh, sizes, beak shapes being either more or less favorable in certain situations. And then we, over time, just saw that uh, the, the population naturally just selected for whatever the advantageous be, uh, beak shape and size was going to be. So for the, the left-hand side, you can see uh, this is called the large cactus finch. This was going to be in a, a situation where it's going to be advantageous to have a fairly large, um, fairly long beak. Whereas if you look at the, the small ground finch, for whatever reason, I don't know the exact reason for all these different finches and like where they live in the exact environment, but for the, the small ground finch, now that lived in an environment where it was going to be more advantageous to have a, a smaller beak, uh, 
And that's why on that island, the, the finches would have that type of beak there. So because these, these finches lived in different locations, they had different environments, they um, over time just adapted for those adapted to those specific environments. And that's why we wound up with these different beak shapes. Um, and then you can see something similar here, uh, two different examples of it. So up top, we've got giraffes. Um, and we can use this giraffe example to look at adaptation versus acclimation. And then we can think of natural selection, um, natural selection as well. Uh, so if we just think about adaptation versus acclimation at first, the reason this is gonna be adaptation is because it wasn't like they were doing some sort of exercise that just gave them a, a longer neck. What actually took place was over time, the, the population itself just naturally selected for the, the giraffes with the, the longer necks to survive because they were able to, to get to the, the food source easier. They were gonna be uh, more fit in that environment. They were gonna be the ones that then reproduce more. So over time, we're gonna see the, the giraffes with the, the smaller necks are eventually gonna sort of die out or at least become a, a smaller segment of the, the population. And then we'll see the, the giraffes with the, the larger necks. That's why they're the ones that actually wound up surviving. They were the ones that were able to pass on their genes. They were able to pass on the, the gene, the trait for the, the longer neck. And that's what we saw over time occur. And then similarly on the, the bottom here, in this case, we've got an example where we're gonna be focused on the, the mice. Um, and in this environment, we've got a mixture of brown and black mice. Um, and then with this, you can kind of think of it as we had a population of one of them, so we could have brown or black mice, and then the, the mutation led to the other. And then this is going to be an example of natural selection because that mutation that made some of these mice uh, have the, the black fur instead of the, the brownish one, that's going to make them more um, sort of camouflage. They're going to blend into their environment better. So now when this predator is flying above, it's not going to be able to see these, uh, these black mice as easily, but it is going to be able to spot the, the lighter colored ones. So that predator is going to come in, take away those lighter colored mice. And now when we go to the, the future, we're going to see the, the population start to naturally select for that darker fur, just because it's going to be better suited for that environment. It's going to be better able to kind of blend into that background. Um, and then with natural selection, um, there are a couple of sort of uh, requirements, sort of characteristics for the, the environment it's in, um, that population that's being dealt with um, for natural selection to occur. Um, there first must be competition for the, the resources. So in this case, what we're saying is the, the population produces more offspring than can actually be supported by that uh, environment. And the, the reason we're gonna be doing that uh, or the reason we require that in terms of natural selection is because if there's no competition for those resources, if there's plenty of resources um, or there's no predator to kind of select for them, like we saw with the, the example with the, the mice on that previous one, there's gonna be no reason for, for one trait to be more advantageous than the other. If there's no competition, there's no real uh, struggle between those different uh, different traits. So there's just gonna be no reason for one of them to be selected over the other. We just won't see natural selection occur if there's no competition. Um, we must have variation among the population. So that means we do have to have some sort of difference if it's a, a homogenous community, meaning that it's exactly the same throughout. There are none of those differences to be selected to begin with. So we just obviously can't have natural selection there. If it then occurred, if a, a mutation then occurs, now we no longer have that homogenous community. Now we do have that variation. It would be possible to have natural selection there. But if everything's the same, there's just nothing to kind of, uh, there's nothing for nature to preferentially select. Um, three, we need the, the traits to be inherited by the offspring. So this is where we can kind of focus on uh, acclimation. Uh, so for example, if you lift a bunch of weights, you're gonna get stronger but that's not gonna be something that you can pass on to the offspring. That's not gonna be an inheritable trait. Um, but whereas over time, if people that are naturally stronger are just sort of selected as the, um, the mate, 
then we may see just offspring eventually get stronger. But uh, with the, the traits that we're looking at, it has to be something that's inheritable. So that's why the, the giraffe's got the, the longer neck. Um, the, if we go back to this one, um, the, the mice changed color as well. The, the finches had their beak shapes changed because that was related to a, a trait. Whereas um, something like the uh, high altitude uh, training for running or just lifting weights in general, that's not gonna be something that's inheritable from one generation to the other. Uh, and then the population must be isolated. And the, the reason this is important is um, if we have it isolated, then we don't have anything kind of coming in to mix with that, that population. So the, the selection will occur, natural selection will occur in that case because there's gonna be some sort of advantageous trait. Um, but if it's not an isolated population, that means you're getting other groups coming in and you're just gonna have a, a whole bunch of different traits mixing. Um, and it just won't, in that case, you won't be able to select for those uh, traits preferentially as much just because you're gonna have uh, a whole host of other things taking place. Um, and then with this, uh, I didn't list it, but also the, um, the, the reproduction must be random. Uh, so if we were to do this, if you were to observe a, a population over time, it could occur, but you wouldn't just be able to uh, select the, the parents. In that case, you would kind of be, um, it wouldn't be natural selection because you'd be choosing it yourself. Um, and then just looking at all three of these things combined. So survival of the fittest, natural selection and evolution are all similar concepts in that having a advantageous trait is gonna be uh, an advantageous trait in terms of the, the environment that you're in is gonna make you better suited for that environment. It's gonna make you better able to survive. And that's what we're looking at with survival of the fittest. We're just looking at um, an organism, an individual, its ability to survive in that environment. The, the most adapted will be the one that survives. And then natural selection, we're looking at it on a slightly larger scale. Now we're seeing the entire population. Um, so now we're gonna see in this case, a whole bunch of these, I don't know what these are supposed to be, worms, centipede, I don't know. Um, but whatever these green things versus the, the blue things are, now that we're looking at natural selection, one of those traits is gonna be more advantageous. And then just kind of thinking about it in terms of camouflage, which one of these is gonna be more able to, to blend in we're gonna see the, the green is gonna be the one that gets naturally selected. And then over time, this is gonna be where we see um, on an even larger scale, this is essentially what we're, we're talking about with evolution. It's just gonna be natural selection over in a tremendous, tremendous amount of time. Whereas um, natural selection is usually looking at uh, a couple of generations. And then um, sort of related to that, uh, we want to think about in addition to adapting to an environment, what are the, uh, the requirements in terms of sort of survival just to begin with? Um, because in, in order to be able to adapt to an environment, you have to be able to, to live in it to begin with. If you just immediately die, if you can't survive in that environment, you're not going to be able to adapt. That means you won't be able to, your, your population's not going to be selected. Um, so you just won't ultimately uh, pass on those traits. Um, and the, the things that we're going to be looking at in terms of what makes it possible for an organism to, to uh, survive in that environment is what are known as limiting factors. And then with these, uh, these limiting factors, some of them like uh, predation, so just being hunted. Uh, obviously, you can't have too little of that, really. Um, but when it comes to things like moisture, especially if we think of plants, for example, uh, plants typically have a sort of range of um, conditions that they can grow in and outside of those conditions. 
they won't be able to survive. So uh, for example, the, the textbook talks about a, a cactus and it's able to withstand a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of sort sort of poor environmental conditions. But one thing it can't survive is just low temperatures. So there's going to be uh, these limiting factors are just going to be uh, factors that make it difficult or make it impossible for an organism to survive in that location. Uh, and like I said, uh, predation is going to be one of them. So just being hunted by a predator, uh, competition with other species. We've talked about a little bit with the, the adaptation, natural selection. You're competing with something else. If they weren't competing, there's plenty of resources to begin with. There'd be no reason for, for nature to select um, one of those traits or the other, uh, over the other. Uh, and then with these, organisms have a whole bunch of limiting factors. Um, but the, the critical factor, the one that's going to kind of be the, the most important is going to be the, the limiting factor that's closest to its tolerance level. So the, the tolerance level or the tolerance limit um, is essentially just the, the threshold at which that organism is no longer going to be able to survive. So for the, the cactus, for example, like I said, it can, it can live in, um, the, the desert where it's extremely hot, extremely high temperatures, extremely low moisture, um, the, the nutrients in the, the soil are very limited. Um, it can survive all of that. But the, the critical factor for the, the cactus is just going to be the, the temperature. If it gets to an environment where the, the temperature gets too low, that's just going to kill the cactus and it won't be able to survive. So since for the, the cactus, that's the most important limiting factor, that's what's going to be referred to as the, the critical factor. Um, and then for those tolerance limits or tolerance levels, um, you may hear both terms or see both terms. Um, what we can kind of think of it as is in terms of sort of a graph like this. And then the environmental factor can be pretty much uh, anything. So it can be temperature, amount of light, uh, pH, any of the things we have on here and a whole bunch of other ones. Um, and then just so we can kind of get an understanding of what this graph looks like or what this is showing us, this bell curve is representing the, the whatever this organism is. So in the, the largest part here, if you look, that's going to be the highest on the y-axis. This is going to be where we've got most of our organisms. They're going to live in this optimal zone of whatever that factor is. So again, it could be temperature, pH, whatever. That's where most of the, the organisms are going to survive. There's going to be this zone of stress on either side. Because again, you can have too much or too little. If it's too hot or too cold, we're not going to be able to survive. If the, the pH is too high or too low, we're not going to be able to survive. We need it kind of in the, the middle there. That's why we've got these minimum and maximum uh, when we're thinking about this. Um, but on either way, once we get outside of this optimal zone, now we're in the, the zone of stress where, we, where those organisms, if you look, some of them, are going to live there, but there's not going to be too much because as we start to move further and further into that zone of stress, they're going to get to the, the zone of intolerance where they're just not going to be able to survive at all. And again, these, this type of diagram, depending on what that environmental factor is, depending on what the, the organism is, is going to look different, but it's still going to be that general idea well, where there's going to be a, an optimal zone, a, a set of conditions that are going to be the most favorable. That's where it's going to be the, the best conditions. That's where it's going to survive. Um, and then if, as we move outside of those conditions, it becomes a little bit more difficult for them to survive. Some of them may be able to. And as we move further and further away, we get to the zone of intolerance where uh, just none of those organisms are going to live. And then um, with these, it can be difficult to. It can be difficult, it can be time consuming, and it can just be um, a lot of work to kind of measure a lot of these environmental factors, make sure that they're in the, the proper ranges. So what they can do sometimes is use what's known as an indicator species. Um, and these indicator species are extremely sensitive to, to certain environmental conditions, environmental factors. Um, so for example, trout have to live in, um, very cool, very clean, very highly oxygenated, uh, oxygenated water. 
Um, so trout are often used as an indicator species for, for uh, water quality, because if they see trout, if there's a trout stream, those trout need very clean water. So it's a good indicator that that water is gonna be uh, fairly good quality. But if there's a place where there was trout in the past and now there's no more trout there, there could be multiple reasons for it. Um, but one possible example, one possible explanation could be that the, the water quality has, uh, has worsened to the point that the, the trout can no longer survive there. They're so sensitive that they couldn't survive. So they either died or they had to uh, find somewhere else to live. And then with this, there's a, a bunch of different indicator species in different um, environmental uh, locations. Um, for example, when I was a, a graduate student at Utah State, uh, I didn't do the work, but one of my advisors, uh, previous grad students, um, was doing a, a project related to, to mayflies, and they were looking at the, the concentration, um, sort of the, the concentrations at which they were affected, just so that they could kind of use those as an indicator species. They wanted to see if they would make a good indicator species to see if they actually were sensitive to whatever those chemicals they were looking at were. And then we've got a couple of definitions as we move into the, the next part. We're going to see kind of what organisms do in their, uh, their environment. Um, so just remember the habitat is referring to the, the place where an organism lives. Um, also includes the, the environmental conditions. And then the, the niche um, is similar, a similar idea. Uh, but in addition, it's going to, to sort of describe the, the role that whatever that species is, plays in that community. And then with that, it's also gonna be somewhat related to um, how that organism is actually distributed throughout the, the community. So, so sort of uh, where it lives and what it does. Uh, and what we can do to kind of think of that is uh, think about two different types of species, two different types of organisms. So we've got a panda uh, and a raccoon. And we're gonna use these as two examples of a, a generalist species. That's gonna be the, the raccoon. And it's gonna be a generalist because it can live in a lot, of different, um, a lot of different places. It can survive a whole bunch of different conditions. Uh, so for example, I've seen raccoon in, I've lived in New York, Utah, Colorado, and Washington. I've seen raccoon in all four of those places. Um, whereas obviously there's no pandas in the, the United States, at least not in, uh, with the exception of zoos. Um, but the, the panda is going to be an example of a, um, a specialist species because now it's not going to be as able to tolerate a, as wide of a range of conditions, environmental conditions. And that's why when we look at this, this graph here, the, the red is representing the, the panda, the, the blue is representing the, the raccoon population, because these um, kind of bell curve looking things, um, these are representing those different organisms and the, the amount of space it has on the, or I guess the, the amount of uh, area under the curve, if you want to think of it that, that way is better. Um, is kind of representing the, the amount of different conditions with which those, uh, those organisms could survive. So since the, the curve for the, the raccoon is much larger, takes up much more space, it's going to be much better able to survive in a lot different uh, sets of conditions, whereas the, the panda, not as much going on. It's not going to be able to uh, survive in as varied of a, an environment. And then we can see uh, where they overlap would just be the, the uh, would be a location where they may be competing um, for those resources. And then with the, the specialist species, um, they don't need to only have one, like only a single location where they, uh, they live. 
But for things like pandas that only do have uh, one environment where they uh, reside, those are known as endemic species. Um, all right. And then we've talked about this a little bit, but we're going to start talking about actual competition um, and kind of just exactly what that means. Um, and what that can kind of look like in different scenarios. Uh, but there's just this quote I took from the, the textbook. Uh, Gauss is just a, a Russian ecologist, I think. Um, but complete com competitors cannot coexist. And what that just means is in the, the environment, if we go back to here, if we think about something, any two organisms, doesn't have to be these two. Uh, but if we ever have a situation like this where there's gonna be overlap in the, the, the niche of those two uh, populations, they're not going to be able to occupy the, the same space. They're not going to be occup occupy that same role um, because eventually one of those organisms is essentially just going to become the, it's going to gain the upper hand. Basically, it's going to get the, the lion's share of whatever those resources are. And when that occurs, the, the second species um, or if there's multiple, the, the remaining ones, what they're going to have to do is either move to a new location, new niche, um, and that it could even just be a, um, a different time where they kind of do their thing. And we'll see if you look at them at the bottom there, one example of that uh, is with swallows and bats. So they can live in the, the same environment. They can eat the, the same flying insects, but because they hunt at different times, swallows, uh, fly around during the day, bats fly around at night. So since they're not occupying the, the same niche, they can still survive in the, the same environment. Um, but if they're trying to occupy the, the same niche, one of them is gonna have to move. Could be time like that with the, the swallow and bat, could just be moving to a, a new location. And then if they don't move, they're either just going to uh, die just because they're gonna not have enough resources there anymore, or they're gonna to have to have some sort of adaptation that's gonna make them better suited for that environment, gonna make them better suited to survive now that they're kind of uh, having to adapt to, um, having to adapt to the, the other competitor kind of take, take in charge. Um, and when that occurs, it's just known as uh, resource partitioning. So the, I'm putting, calling it the, the losing species just because it's the, the one that got out-competed essentially. Um, but with the, the swallows and the bats, they just switch to different times of days. They can still occupy the, the same niche um, or the same location, different niche, um, since they have different roles now. Um, and then a, a similar example um, is a, a warbler. There's, I forget where it was, but there's a, uh, a warbler that wound up adapt, getting a series of adaptations. And then what had happening, uh, wound up happening was that the, the different warblers just moved to different locations, different sort of canopy levels of that tree and were able to, to coexist that way. Um, so they were able to find different niches and able to uh, sort of coexist. And then this we've talked about a little bit already. We haven't exactly put in a put a, a term to it, uh, but speciation is just the, the development of new species. And this comes after uh, just adaptations over time. So like the, the Galapagos finches, they were all gonna be the, they all started from the, the same, uh, same finch originally. And then based on their uh, location, because they were on different islands, they had different environments. Um, they adapted to those different environments. And ultimately we wound up with 13 different species uh, of finch on those Galapagos islands. Um, and the speciation, this process, when it happens occurring, uh, when it happens due to geographic isolation, so like with those finches, when, this, when these adaptations occur due to different environments um, and being separate from one another, this is allopatric speciation. Um, and then when it does occur in the, the same location, that would be sympatric speciation. 
Um, so if the, the species were to develop uh, simultaneously in the, the same location with the, the finches, which I believe did occur with a couple of them on the, the same islands. I think there was uh, at least a couple that had like two different types of finches on the, the same island because they wound up uh, adapting to different niches. Um, and in that case, it would be a, a sympatric speciation because they were in the same location. And then um, with this, like I said before, mutations, um, a lot of the times just aren't going to be advantageous or disadvantageous. Um, a lot of the times they just don't really impact natural selection um, at all. Um, but every once in a while they do, that's what we've been uh, focusing on. And depending on the, the factors that are sort of uh, involved with whatever that mutation is, we can see the, the selection occur in a, a variety of different ways. And that's referred to, to selection pressure. So the, the factors that make certain mutations more advantageous and the, the direction or the, the way, the manner in which the, the selection occurs um, kind of tells us a little bit something about those traits. Um, there's something known as stabilizing selection. And in this case, what we're going to be doing is reducing variation. So we're going to be having uh, the, the trait be more and more similar. We're going to have sort of a, a more uniform population in terms of whatever that trait is. Um, and one example of that, or two examples of that, actually, uh, if you think about birth weight in um, babies, they're not all exactly the same, but over time we've uh, selected for a, a relatively constant uniform uh, weight for those babies. Uh, and the, the reason for that is because that weight range, and again, it's not an exact number, there is a little deviation to it, but there is that, that optimal range that's gonna be the, the most beneficial in terms of the, the survival of the, the offspring. Where it's, if it's too heavy or uh, too light, it may not uh, survive. And then similarly with the, the density of cactus spine, um, those spine are liable to, to lose water. Um, so if they, the cactus has too many of them, it won't be able to, to retain water as well, essentially. If it had too little of them, the, the spine wouldn't really be protecting that cactus at all. So the, the animals in the desert would be able to get at it for the, the water. Um, so with the stabilizing selection, what we're seeing is the, the trait being uh, becoming more and more uniform, kind of moving to the, the middle of whatever that is. Um, and then we've got what's known as, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, directional selection. And what this is going to do is it's going to favor the whatever that trait is. It's going to favor it sort of on the extreme. So it's going to shift it one way or the other, rather than the, the stabilizing, which was kind of pushing everything towards the middle. Um, and with this one, I want to uh, point out that the, the directional is just going to be shifting it one way or the other. So for example, uh, on those Galapagos Islands, um, a drought occurred, and that drought, for a variety of reasons, led to um, less small seeds being available on that island. So with less small seeds, the larger billed finches, the ones with the, the bigger beaks, were more able to, to get at the, the larger seeds. They were more able to easily survive. They were able to um, pass on their, their traits. So over time on that island, the, the finch is naturally selected for a, a larger beak. And in that case, this, that would be an example of a directional selection because we're going to be taking that trait and pushing it all the way to the extreme. We're going to be making it um, just the, the large versus the, the small, essentially, um, in this case. And then the, the third type of selection pressure 
Um, so stabilizing kind of pushes everything to the, the average almost. Directional is going to push it one way or the other. Um, so a lot or a little of whatever that trait may be. Um, with this, the, the final one, what we're going to be looking at is disruptive selection. And what this is going to do is almost the, the opposite of stabilizing. So stabilizing kind of pushes everything to, to be uniform in the middle. This disruptive is going to kind of push everything to the extremes. It's going to push it one way or the other, but it's going to push it both ways. Um, and an example of this one is going to be looking at oysters. Um, and then oysters want to blend in so that they can survive. Uh, so light, co light colored oysters, excuse me, um, are able to easily blend into the rocks. Dark colored oysters are going to be able to, to blend into shadows. But if you kind of have a, a medium colored oyster, something in the, the middle there, uh, it's going to be, a, it's going to be visible in both scenarios. So it's going to be, uh, dark enough that it's going to be visible on the rocks. It's going to be light enough that it's still going to be visible in the shadows. So it's not really going to offer it as any, uh, offer it any advantages. Whereas if we take that trait and push it one way or the other, if we make it a very light colored oyster, it'll blend in with the rocks. If we make it a very dark colored oyster. It's going to blend in with the shadows and either of those are going to be advantageous. So that's what we're going to be referring to as a, a disruptive selection. We're going uh, to both extremes, essentially. And we can visualize these uh, types of uh, selection with these images here. Um, so one of them is referring to a stabilizing selection. One of them is a disruptive, and one of them is directional. Uh, and what's being shown here, just so you get an understanding, is the, the y-axis is just the, the, the number of those organisms. The x-axis is whatever that trait is. And the, the red line is kind of showing us what that population looked like to start. And then the, the blue is representing what, it, uh, what happened after the, the selection process occurred. So for the, the first one, and the, the original is a, the same, so that red line is the, the same for all of them. Um, so for the, the first one, we're taking that population and we're skewing it to the right. The second one, we're taking that population and just squeezing it even tighter. And then the, the third one, we're taking that population and kind of forcing it one way or the other. Uh, but it's going both ways in this case. So if you'd like, you could kind of pause the video quick. Just think back to those different types of selection. So again, um, stabilizing, uh, directional, and disruptive. See if you can just kind of quickly identify which one uh, is one, which one is two, and which one is three. And if you want to pause it, you can, um, so you have a little time to think about it, but I'm just going to kind of go into explaining it now. Um, so the, the first one is going to be our directional, because we're taking it and we're pushing it just to the right. Two will be stabilizing because we're going to be taking it and forcing everything in the middle. We're going to be making it more uniform almost. Um, and then the, the disruptive one, this is going to be the example like with the, the oysters. Uh, you could think of light color on one side, dark color on the other. So they're going to be able to survive on the, in the rocks. They're going to be able to survive in the shadows. But these medium colored ones, the ones that are kind of in the middle there, wouldn't blend into either of those environments. So it's going to be uh, pretty easy for a predator to see those. And that's why we're seeing these uh, middle colored uh, oysters. If we want to think of them in terms of that, we're seeing those decrease. Um, and then for the first one, this would be the, the same type of example as with the, the finches, the, the larger beak ones. Um, this was our initial population. And then after the drought, the, the amount of smaller seeds declined. So then the, the population naturally selected for the, uh, the larger uh, beaked finches. And then this is going to be a, a stabilizing um, selection, sort of like with the, the weights of babies. Um, what was the other example? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, the density of the cactus. Man, that's right. Um, again, in either case, the reason for both of those that we're going to wind up with the, the population kind of getting thinner on this graph is because it's going to be uh, more advantageous 
if the, the babies all have kind of that similar weight in the middle, rather than having some of them be extremely light or extremely heavy. The same thing with the, the density of those cactus spine, having sort of an average uh, medium value for that trait is more advantageous because it still offers protection for the cactus while not, um, not being, not allowing for as much potential water loss. Um, so it kind of balances out uh, protection with maintaining the, the water that it needs. All right, and then with the species interactions, we've kind of already touched on this quite a bit, um, but we're going to put some terms to it. So interest specific competition um, between members of the, the same species. And then inter is going to be between different ones. So if you think about an intrastate, it's a road within one state, interstate is going to be the, the main uh, highways connecting the entire country. Um, so you can kind of think of it in terms of that. Uh, and then for at least the, the intraspecific competition. So when we're looking at members of the same species uh, competing, one or at least a couple ways that the that this is sometimes resolved within that species um, is for the, the young to just disperse and go somewhere new, find new land so that they can find new resources. They don't have to compete with the, uh, the older, stronger, uh, whatever organism we're, we're dealing with. Um, sometimes you'll see them be extremely territorial. And this is in terms of the, like the adults. Um, and they'll do this in order to just drive the offspring away. And then the same thing occurs with um, just other uh, organisms in that species, uh, in that area rather. Um, and then in other cases, you'll see the adults and juveniles kind of occupy different niches. So similar to the, the bats versus the swallows, rather than competing at the, the same time, the bats come out at night. Um, you can sometimes see similar processes occur with the adults and juveniles where they, they kind of take different roles uh, so that they don't have to compete. They can work either collectively or they can kind of just ignore each other, um, similar to the, the bats and the swallows. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, and then with this, uh, that competition often leads to predator-prey relationships. Um, and these also naturally lead to adaptation, naturally lead to uh, selection as well. And the, the reason for that is if you think about it, um, just think about cat and mouse. Um, as the cat becomes a, or the, the cat population, because uh, we're not really thinking of it in terms of the individuals at this point, the, the population of the, the predator. As that predator becomes a better hunter, um, the, the prey population is just going to decrease because they're going to be hunted more often. But what that's going to um, allow for is the, the, the prey is going to adapt. The ones that are better suited for the environment, the ones that are better suited at avoiding those predators are going to be the ones that survive, the ones that pass on that trait. And then we're going to see the, the predators are then going to have to adapt to sort of counteract that. And it's going to be sort of this back and forth, almost an arms race. Um, and what this is known as when the, the adaptation occurs between two species kind of simultaneously in conjunction with one another, um, that's going to be referred to as coevolution. And uh, an example of that would just be the, the cheetah versus the gazelle. So the cheetahs hunt gazelles. Um, and then cheetahs can get up to is it 45, 50 miles an hour, something like that. So very high speeds, but they can't maintain it um, for very long times. The, the gazelle, on the other hand, doesn't have quite as high of a speed but it can run for a super long time. It's a very, uh, very high endurance um, animal. So if the, the gazelle can kind of escape that, that cheetah in the initial short burst of energy that that cheetah has, the gazelle is going to be able to get away. But if the cheetah is able to um, get to it initially, it's going to be able to, to get to it just because it's going to be the, the faster sprinter pretty much. Um, and this is an example of coevolution because over time we've seen those, uh, those two organisms kind of adapt, kind of evolve, to 
uh, in the cheetah sense to to be a better hunter of the gazelle and then in the the gazelle sense to be uh, more suited at avoiding the, the cheetah and then um, what can also occur is um, over time species that have chemical defenses um, so this could be things like snakes in some cases. It could be uh, if you've ever seen the like the tropical tree frogs that they have in different rainforests, um, they have those bright colors on them. The, the reason they do that is kind of a, a signal. It's an adaptation over time to, to warn other predators that they're poisonous, they're venomous, that they're, whatever they um, like whatever they have going on is something that those predators are going to want to avoid. Uh, and then what can also happen is organisms that aren't poisonous or venomous um, can do what's known as Batesian mimicry. And they're actually gonna adapt to look similar to whatever that poisonous or venomous organism is, but it's gonna be uh, essentially harmless. And one example of that is gonna be the, the coral snake versus the, the king snake. So the, the coral snake on the left here uh, is gonna be venomous. If it bit you, it would, um, would likely kill you if you didn't have, uh, or at least if it didn't kill you, you'd definitely be in a, a bad situation um, if you didn't receive proper treatment and care for that. The, the king snake, on the other hand, looks very similar. You can see we've got similar red, black, and yellow striping on it. Obviously, it's not exactly the same, but it's uh, a pretty good uh, impression. But the, the king snake on the, the right, if you startle it, if you scare it, it still will bite you but it's just not gonna be venomous. Um, but having this sort of defense built in, having it look like that coral snake, the other organisms are gonna to know to stay away from that coral snake because they're gonna just over time, they're gonna see other animals get bit by a coral snake and die. And it's just gonna sort of become a learned behavior that they're gonna to wanna to avoid that snake. But now that this king snake looks similar, it's gonna have that sort of protection, even though it doesn't have any of the, the venom, doesn't really have any of the the, the bite to it that the, the coral snake does. Um, and then uh, there's just a, a common saying, I don't actually know where these snakes are. So I don't know if they're actually anything you'd have to deal about, uh, like worry about around here, I would doubt it. Um, if they're in America, I would guess they're probably in the Southwest. Um, but there's a saying, red touch yellow, kill a fellow. And what that's referring to is the, the coral snake, because in this case, the, the coral snake has the, the red, uh, right next to the yellow as it kind of repeats in those different, um, that different pattern. So red touch yellow kill a fellow because the, the coral snake is gonna be the, the venomous one. Red touch black, safer jack, so just a, it's just a saying. So obviously they're just trying to find a rhyme there. Um, but in this case, since the, the red is touching the, the black rather than the yellow, um, that's how you can kind of distinguish between the, the two of them. Um, but if you think about other, other animals coming across these in the, the environment, they're not gonna have that saying in their head. So they're just gonna see uh, a red, black and yellow snake with the, these stripes on it. And they're not gonna really be able to, to differentiate between the two. So it's probably gonna be more uh, likely that they're gonna play it safe and just kind of avoid both of those snakes. Um, and then, like I said, this occurs with uh, other organisms. So there's certain beetles and other insects uh, that look like wasps and uh, like bees and things like that. Uh, there's some butterflies that look like other types of butterflies. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't think of any other ones, but there are uh, a whole bunch of different examples of this. Um, and then in addition to just pure competition, sometimes there are relationships um, in, where they actually live together. And that's what we're referring to as symbiosis. Uh, it's a sim symbiotic relationship when they, they live closely together. Um, and in this case, we're referring to two different species or more, could be multiple different things, uh, but we're looking at multiple different species. And uh, with symbiosis, we've got a couple different different types of these symbiotic relationships. So mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Um, so just going through them quickly and thinking about a couple examples. Uh, so mutualism, just as it sounds, if it's mutually beneficial, it's beneficial for both of the parties involved. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, 
with mutualism, this is going to be an example of a relationship where both organisms are going to be benefiting from it. Um, so one example uh, is actually you are one example, uh, the, the gut bacteria that you have in your, um, your gut. The different foods and stuff that you consume is going to, to help feed those bacteria. Just uh, the stuff that goes through your um, digest digestive tract is going to essentially feed those bacteria, but then those bacteria um, also help keep you healthy. So they do a whole bunch of different stuff um, that is beneficial for uh, our survival and just making us feel good. Uh, and then similarly, you got this picture on the, the right of it. Uh, I forget exactly what these are. I think it's an impala and then uh, I don't know what type of bird it is. Uh, but there's other examples like this. Um, there's crocodiles that have different birds on them that kind of pick away at them. In this case, the, the bird is going to eat uh, different insects, different uh, just stuff crawling around on the, the impala that the impala wouldn't really want, but can't remove itself. Um, so in this way, the impala kind of gets cleaned. The, the bird is going to get the, the food it needs. Uh, like I said, there's similar examples with crocodiles uh, and birds um, different, uh, fish and stuff like that have, uh, similar things going on. Um, but with mutualism, we're looking at both of those parties are going to be benefiting from it. Um, and then commensalism, the, the next one, uh, again, we have two species living close together. In this case, one of them is going to be benefiting and the other is just going to be, uh, just, um, indifferent to it essentially it's not going to be helped it's not going to be harmed so it's not really going to care too much what's going on and we'll see a couple examples on the next slide of that uh but the the final one parasitism parasitism there we go um just whenever you, there's a parasite uh in this case there's going to be the the parasite is going to be benefiting it's going to be dependent on whatever that host is uh, so if you think about ticks fleas tapeworms anything like that uh those are all gonna be examples of parasitism because they're gonna be benefiting at the harm of the host. So they're gonna be doing damage to whatever that organism is. Um, a lot of times the, the parasites ultimately kill the host. Um, so obviously that's not gonna be beneficial. It's gonna harm the host. Uh, and that's why we're gonna be looking at these three different types of symbiotic relationships. Uh, but just with the, the commensalism, um, So uh, again, in this example, or in this type of relationship, one of the, the organisms is going to benefit and the other is just not going to have uh, anything occur really. Uh, so one example that I wanted to point out is just the, man, I've got the met game on in the background, they just blew the lead. Uh, but with the commensalism, the, the reason this is going to be uh, beneficial for one is because in this case, the frog is going to be able to use those plants as protection. It's going to be able to kind of hop around, move around to have those leaves kind of hide it from different predators. And then the plant itself isn't going to be benefited from this. Uh, depending on the plant, maybe in some way you could help it get pollinated. You can move the, the seeds around, uh, help it that way, but it's really not doing anything positive or negative for the, the plant. It's only benefiting the, the tree frog. That's why it's going to be an example of commensalism. Uh, the same thing with these other examples here. So the, the jackal that just follows around a, a tiger. The, the tiger is going to hunt. The tiger is going to eat what it wants. And then the jackal is just going to come up, kind of follow it around and eat the scraps. So the, the jackal benefits because it gets food. But the, the tiger isn't hurt or uh, isn't helped or harmed because it still gets all of the, the food it wants initially. And then just kind of when it leaves, the jackal comes in and cleans up the rest. Okay. Um, and then the, I think this is the, the final thing we're going to be really looking at um, in this chapter is the, the keystone species, at least in terms of the, the lecture. Um, and then these keystone species are just going to be extremely important species within a, uh, a biological community. Um, so if you think back to the, the food webs and the, the food chain and stuff like that, I talked about how it's important that every or that every organism is important because if we remove one, it kind of is going to affect everything else. Uh, these keystone species are going to be the same. They're just going to essentially be ext like extremely, extremely important. 
Uh, and originally these keystone species were, were thought to just be um, apex predators so at the very, very top of the, the food chain, food web. Uh, that's now known to not be the, the case. There are certain microorganisms um, that are extremely vital to the, um, the ecosystems that they live in. And if we removed all of those microorganisms, the ecosystem would collapse. Um, and that's essentially what we would see if we removed these keystone species as well. Um, so the, the one we're seeing here is looking at the, the, the shark as a keystone species. And if we just kind of look at the, the left-hand side, the, the shark, the top predator, is going to eat these rays. And then these rays are going to eat the uh, even lower down on that food web. So we've got the, the uh, anthropods uh, and things like that. And when we have that keystone species present, it's going to allow the um, it's going to allow the the community the ecosystem to remain stable because these sharks are going to feed on these these rays. That's going to keep the the rays in check, which is then going to keep the uh, even lower down in the the food web in check. But now, if we remove this shark, we remove that keystone species. Now we're removing. The, the predator for these rays. So these rays are going to kind of grow out of control in terms of their population. There's not going to be anything to take them out. So what the, the rays are going to do is just continue to reproduce and continue to feed uh, on that lower down portion of the, the food web until they essentially uh, just deplete it so much that the, the, the rays themselves now have no food. Um, and again, it doesn't have to just be the, the apex predator. Oftentimes it is uh, the apex predator that we think of as the, the keystone species, but it's going to be any uh, species that is extremely critical to the, the survival of that ecosystem as a whole. Um, and I don't know why I put this on the, the same thing, but it's just showing you the, the same sort of image blown up a little bit more. And again, if we remove the, the sharks, we no longer have anything to keep these rays in control. So they're just gonna increase their population and just overfeed on the, the rest of these species. And it's gonna throw off the, the food web there. And that's why you can kind of see what they're showing here. With that keystone species, we're able to keep the, the ecosystem in check, that uh, community is gonna survive. But once we remove it, everything crumbles. Um, and the, the keystone species is the, just an extremely important one, but you can kind of see the, the same idea. Even if we remove any of these other species, you can think about it, we would still have that same uh, process occur. Uh, it's just some species, the, the ecosystem can still kind of weather the loss of it. Um, it's not great, it's not ideal, uh, but it can kind of, kind of survive with the, the keystone species, that's not gonna be the case. Um, and another example is gonna be the, the jaguar in the, um, jungles of uh, South America. And these jaguars eat an extremely uh, varied diet. So they hunt a bunch of different things. And what that allows the, the jaguar to do is sort of the same thing the shark was doing here with the ray. But the, the jaguar is then able to sort of uh, just keep stable the rest of those uh, populations. Because if anything starts to get extremely, extremely popular, like a lot of any of those organisms, they're just naturally gonna get hunted by the, uh, the jaguar in that case, and it's gonna help keep that population where it should be. Uh, and then with this, we should point out, um, or I should point out the keystone species is important for the, the biodiversity of that community. Again, if we remove the, the shark, we remove, we wind up losing all of this stuff at the bottom will ultimately wind up losing these rays as well because now they don't have anything to, to feed on after they completely depleted it. Um, so with the, the keystone species, uh, they help keep those populations stable, which helps keep the, the biodiversity high. Oh, and I guess there's more to this. I forgot there's population. Okay, so with the, the population, um, oh, the chapter four is the short one. All right. Uh, population um, and population growth specifically. If you look, we've got a couple different shapes to these. Um, on the left, we're showing exponential. 
because in this case, there's going to be uh, no limit on the, the resources available. So there's gonna be nothing really stopping the, the growth of this population. It's just gonna uh, have those organisms continuously reproduce and reproduce because there's nothing sort of preventing them from doing so. There's always plenty of resources in that situation. And we can see something similar here, at least for the, the first half of this graph. So you can see we've got that similar J shape to start, but then with the logistic growth, we wind up having it uh, kind of flatten out. We wind up with an S shape overall, because in this case, there's going to be what's known as the, the carrying capacity. And this is going to be what sort of limits the, the, the population of a, uh, a certain species in an area. And the, the carrying capacity um, is going to be dependent on the, the amount of resources present, the uh, environment that they're living in. Um, but basically, it's just a measure of the, the number of animals or the, the biomass of, a, of animals that can be supported in an area without harvest. So without basically collecting things and supplying. Um, and if you look at the, the image on the right, you can see we start out with that exponential growth. So we've got that J shape. And then it shoots right past the, the carrying capacity. It shoots past that dotted line. When that occurs, what that's saying is now we've got more organisms than can be supported by the, the resources in this environment. So we overshot the, the carrying capacity. And now we don't have enough supplies essentially to, to support all of these organisms. So we see what's called dieback because we're gonna have uh, some of those organisms are gonna die from starvation, um, malnutrition, just there's not gonna be enough resources present. So we're gonna see the, the community dip back down. And then uh, you can see this process kind of occur over and over again until we eventually get to sort of a stable, um, hopefully a stable um, population. And then with this, I should also say, you don't automatically always overshoot it and kind of have this process occur. Um, the, the ideal is kind of something like this, where as you approach that carrying capacity, uh, you level out so that you, you kind of keep the, the population in line with the amount of resources um, that are available. And then this is kind of uh, just one specific example of a, a predator prey relationship. Um, so we've got the, the hair and the length, and this occurred in, uh, I believe these are these measurements come from uh, animals in Canada, um, but the the lynx is just going to be a predator of the the hare. And if we look, we can see so the green is representing the hare, the the red dotted is going to be the the lynx, and you can see that these um, peaks and valleys kind of match up. They're a little offset, not perfect, because what's occurring here is as the uh, the hair population increases. Now there's plenty of resources for the, the lynx. So we're going to see the, the lynx population start to increase as well. But as these lynx start to increase, now there's more and more of those predators to hunt. They're going to start to hunt more and more of those hair. And as we start to see the lynx population increase, it gets to a point where they're over hunting the hair. So we see the, the hair really start to drop down a dramatic decrease. And at that point, now these, uh, these links don't have enough resources to survive. Then a little bit after, they start to die off as well. But once they get low, now the, the hair population can replenish. And you see the, the lynx population replenish after that. Um, so you can kind of see this uh, back and forth within a, a predator-prey relationship. You can see the um, the cause and effect almost. As the, the hairs go up, the hair population goes up, the lynx population goes up, but then those lynx overhunt. So the, the hair drops down, the lynx now don't have enough resources, they drop down as well. And it's kind of just that cycle repeating over and over. Um, but like I said, with the uh, population growth, um, it's not exponential generally. Um, at least after the initial point. The uh, initial point can be uh, exponential like we're seeing here, but then it flattens out as we approach the, the carrying capacity because we don't have enough resources to continue that growth. 
Uh, so the, the growth rate just naturally slows down in that case. Um, and with this, I'm not gonna be, this is the actual equation. So you can kind of figure out the, the rate at which that population is changing. Um, I'm not gonna be too concerned with how like actually plugging stuff in and using this equation. Um, but what I wanna point out is what a couple of these variables represent. Um, and what this is, is uh, R is the, the exponential rate of the, the population growth. N is gonna be the population itself. So what this is really just showing is the, the change in population over the change in time. D just means change. So change in population over the, the change in time. So it's just the, the rate of change of the population. Um, R is gonna be the, the constant. It's gonna be the, the actual rate. And then K is gonna be the, the carrying capacity. So K is carrying capacity. R is related to the, the rate. Um, so R related to rate, there's something called R selected organisms. And these rely on a high rate of reproduction. So in this case, R selected organisms are gonna be organisms um, that basically produce a whole bunch of offspring but not many of them are gonna survive. So it's not the reason we're focused on the, the rate in this case is because not many of them are gonna survive. So we're not really concerned with the, the carrying capacity at all. That's where we're focused just on the rate with these organisms. And what we're looking at here, um, you can think of something like a, uh, an acorn tree. Uh, so if you think about it, there's gonna be thousands of acorns initially. At time zero, the, the acorns fall off the tree. Um, but not all of those acorns are actually gonna grow up and form full trees. Similarly with fish, they release a whole bunch of eggs, but not all of those eggs are gonna make it to, to adulthood. I mean, if you've seen Finding Nemo, they talk about it. Um, so with this, what it's, uh, referring to is we're just going to basically throw out a whole bunch of chances and then hope that a few of them survive. So the R selected organisms are just interested in the, um, the high rate of reproduction because they're just basically throwing a whole bunch of things against the wall, hoping something sticks, hoping they get a few offspring that survive, hope they get a few offspring that can then pass on their traits. Um, whoops. And then the, the K selected organisms. So again, K is referring to the, the carrying capacity. These are gonna be the organisms um, that their, their population is gonna be more dependent on the, the carrying capacity itself. And with that, we're looking at things like humans. And the, the reason for this is um, because humans, if you think about it, most at most usually are gonna have a couple of kids. And then at least now, um, hopefully most of them are gonna survive to, to reach adulthood. So we're gonna see something like this where you can see it's a much gradual, gradual decrease um, because more and more of those offspring are surviving for a longer and longer period of time. So now we're having less offspring to begin with um, and more of them are surviving to adulthood. So the, the carrying capacity, the amount of resources actually available for these offspring for this organism is going to be much more important. Um, and then there's other things like birds, which kind of fall in the, the middle here. Um, so they produce a pretty good amount of eggs. Some of those eggs don't make it to uh, like ducklings or whatever um, type of bird you want to think of it as. Um, but a pretty good amount of them are. And then a pretty good amount of those are going to make it to uh, sort of adulthood. So it's going to be more of a constant loss, whereas the R selected organisms, type three, um, most of them aren't gonna survive. And then the uh, K selected organism, organisms, there's not gonna be many of them to start, but most of them will make it to their uh, adulthood. And then with this, just cause this was kind of a, a longer one, um, 
I'm not gonna go over chapter or sections 3.4 and 3.5 in this video. Um, I'm just gonna ask that you kind of read through it. And then if you do have any questions on the, the content in those sections or in any of the, the previous sections, any of the, the lectures as well, um, always just let me know and I'm happy to discuss it with you uh, individually.